Before we get to our example of how virtual memory actually uh, works in practice, uh, let's uh, cover a few more topics uh, before we do that. One is how virtual memory helps with uh, memory management and protection, uh, sharing and protection, and uh, how we do, how we speed up address translation. First, how does a virtual memory manage multiple processes? Well, the key abstraction, remember, is that each process has its own virtual address space. Uh, the virtual address space is a simple array uh, in memory, a linear array of one byte after the other. Uh, but this linear virtual address space does not need to be contiguous in physical memory. Because we're mapping things at the level of pages or blocks of virtual memory, we can put any virtual page at any location in physical memory, uh, at any physical page uh, in physical memory. So uh, we don't have to worry about the, the virtual page one being just before virtual page two and then virtual page three and so on. As we think about it in the virtual address space, these can be scattered throughout the physical memory and can be in any order. So this helps us really fit things in uh, as needed and not have to worry about moving things around so that they're always in exact same order. How does uh, virtual memory help with protection and sharing? Well, uh, now we can do things like, for example, here we have a physical page, uh, physical page six, that might be some library code that two processes need. Well, they can both have part of their virtual address space mapped to that same physical uh, address uh, where physical page six is. Uh, that way they can share the code uh, for that routine, uh, that library code. Uh, likewise, uh, we can protect the processes from each other by giving them pages that they are the only ones that have an address for. Uh, they have the physical address, but uh, in the other process does not. In this case, uh, process two cannot access physical page two uh, because it doesn't have the address for physical page two anywhere in its uh, page tables. Uh, so that's a, a very easy way to keep uh, two processes from stepping on each other just making sure that they have different physical pages uh, allocated to them. Okay. Uh, lastly, uh, about these page table entries is they're not, they don't have to be just simply uh, addresses in physical memory. We can add additional uh, bits to that. You've already seen the valid bit uh, as telling us whether this uh, entry contains a valid address in physical memory or not. But we can also have uh, a bit, for example, that tells us we have write permission to this area, uh, or we can only read this area. This would be very useful, for example, in the case when we have uh, those shared libraries uh, of code, where we might want to be able to read that code, but not necessarily be able to write to it. Uh, we can also uh, have a bit, for example, that provides permission to execute code in that uh, physical uh, memory so that we can protect from uh, code injection attacks like we saw with uh, uh, the buffer overflow uh, earlier. So um, these can be quite useful uh, in doing that. And, and there is a special hardware that checks that the kind of memory access we're trying to do, a read or a write or an execute, um, an instruction fetch uh, is actually allowed uh, for this physical address. And if it's not allowed, then the operating system raises a, uh, a segmentation fault uh, exception and uh, our program crashes. And uh, we can then go about the debugging process to make sure that we're using it correctly. Okay, uh, so that's the, uh, how we implement protection of various forms. Let's uh, go back to address translation uh, and uh, what happens uh, in the case of a page hit. And then we'll look at a page fault as well. So we start off, of course, with generating a virtual address from our CPU instructions. Uh, this goes to our memory management unit for translation. What the memory management unit has to do is go to uh, the page table entry. And for that, it needs to generate a page table entry address. Remember, it looks at that uh, page table buffer register to give it the starting address of the page table, and uh, then indexes it appropriately for the virtual address involved. 
and uh, goes and reads that entry from main memory. Uh, if it's valid and there's a good address there, uh, then it does the mapping, generating the physical address, and accesses the memory again to read the, that location in physical memory. That data comes back to the CPU as the result. So we've done two memory accesses, one to get the page table entry and one to get the actual data uh, that we're interested in. All right, what happens on a page fault? Well, on a page fault, what happens is that uh, we've gone and gotten our page table entry uh, brought that back to the memory management unit and found that the page is invalid. Uh, so we now have to go and uh, involve the operating system in helping us get that page from disk and loading it into uh, the physical memory. So that's going to cause an exception that goes to this page fault handler, which is a special uh, piece of code in the operating system that knows what to do with these situations. When the, the page fault handler might write the victim page, the page it has to replace, uh, back into disk in case that we had written anything there. We want to make sure we're saving that away. So it writes that back to disk, uh, that optionally, uh, and then gets the new page from the disk, the one that we really want, and brings that into that location in physical memory where the victim page was. It now has to update the page table entries uh, to reflect this change in the physical memory, and then uh, can re-execute the instruction, have it generate a new virtual address uh, again, uh, that actually the same virtual address, but issue it again, so that now when we go and read the page table entry, we'll find a valid, uh, a valid bit on, and then can execute that uh, instruction. So. Uh, we're executing uh, quite a lot of stuff here. Uh, we're doing a lot of operations to get this uh, memory mapping to happen properly. Uh, the MMU accesses memory twice, once to get the, f the, P uh, the PTE for translation, and then again for the actual memory request. Okay, and um, we have to remember that since the page table entries are, are in fact in memory, they can be cached, uh, just like any other memory word. Uh, but might get evicted by other data references, just like any other memory word. Uh, and this starts to act, potentially add up in, uh, since we're doing this for every memory address. Uh, so how can we make this uh, process go faster? So to do that, we're going to uh, create another construct called a translation lookaside buffer, or TLB. This is another cache. Uh, which we're going to use just for the MMU. This is a special little tiny cache that the MMU is going to use to store away uh, page table entries, basically, to keep them around in case it needs them again. And remember, because of locality, its chances are we'll be accessing many uh, bytes of memory in the same page. Therefore, we'll be reusing the same page table entry over and over again. So the TLB is going to be a special mapping cache for virtual page numbers to physical page numbers. Uh, and, and it's going to contain these uh, page table entries. Typically, a TLB is uh, 128 to 256 entries. Uh, not all that much, but things on the order of a working set size. OK, so how does, thing, how does this work now with a TLB in place? Uh, remember, the TLB there is to eliminate a memory access uh, to go get that page table entry. So now we generate our virtual address, but the MMU isn't going to go to memory to find the page table entry. It's first going to check in its little cache, the TLB. And if it finds it there, great. It just gets it really quickly, uh, ideally within a single cycle, rather than the three or more cycles it might need to go to the cache. Uh, since it has the page table entry now, it can do that translation right away and just go immediately to uh, the physical address and uh, try to get that out of the cache and memory system. Okay, so that looks a little faster, looks a little bit better. We're still doing a little bit of lookup, but this can be done now very quickly uh, since we have this tiny little cache that can help us out and we can make special hardware to make that fast. Okay. Now, what happens on a miss? Let's say we go to the TLB, 
for a particular page table entry, it's not there. Well, now uh, we have the same situation we had before. We have to go back out to the cache, read that page table entry uh, at, a, at the right address, uh, bring that entry back to the MMU, but at the same time, we're going to load it into the TLB in case we need it again. And of course, that involves the TLB finding place a place to put it, uh, which might mean finding uh, a spot in its little cache. So that could be potentially uh, replacing some other entry, uh, which uh, we might also need, but now will be gone because we have uh, to override it with this one. Okay. TLB misses tend to be pretty rare. So uh, fortunately, this doesn't happen that often. Uh, but when it does, it's just like any other cache is the way to think about it. We have to find room for the new element to be, uh, the new block to be placed in the cache. Okay. And then, uh, of course, once we have that new page table entry, uh, we can then generate the physical address we need to go to memory with the data coming back to the CPU.